very welcome to our witty talk today with Swithin from Mason Breeze. And uh, I welcome you especially because actually I am at the start summit here in St. Gallen. You see, I even have to. Ooh, super band around myself. Um, Start Summit is a really cool event by the University of Sokolen. It's Europe-wide where all startups come together, investors, and and uh, have a chit chat. And it's actually the first event since two years. That's really in person. It's totally amazing. <laughs> but now come to let's go, let's get to Switham. Switham, very happy welcome to you to our witty talk. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Nadia. It's nice to be here. I'm in Zurich as well. It's uh, great to be here, sun's shining. All yeah, good. sun's shining. It's finally, right? Finally nice yeah. weather. Gets me yeah. lots uh, of motivation. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, Swithin, you and me talk about inclusive language and what it can do for business. And naturally, we also broaden a little bit about diversity and inclusion in general. Um, but let me first present you. <laughs> okay. So. And I think your CV is really, really interesting and because it has a lot of uh, zigzags and it's actually a little bit like mine as well. So <laughs> I see some uh, some comparisons there. Well, you have a geography degree from the University of College, uh, um, University College London. That's what you started with. But then actually did a subject change into chartered accountant with Coopers and Library. And then you're saying that this is quite typical for the English um, uh, uh, education system. Can you tell us why? Yeah. So I, I remember working early in my career with a um, with a Spanish guy who was really cross that he had had to choose subjects when he was about 13 or something, which led to him becoming a professional accountant. Whereas I was able to switch, and become a professional accountant from the age of 21 with three years of study while I worked. And he felt it wasn't fair that I'd been allowed to study this stuff, which was what I really wanted to study. Um, the British system is just set up like that. You can transfer to law or accounting from any degree at all if the firm takes you. So it's more, more a question of, you know, what were your grades like up to that point? Um, and 75% of my year group, my geography year group, became chartered accountants. There was ah, no okay. In 1994, <laughs> there were not very many jobs. These days, you become an environmental scientist, but, you know, okay. back then that didn't exist. Okay, cool. Cool. And then actually you went to travel quite a lot. You went to Sierra Leone. Um, you set up an education NGO. Um, and you also went to um, where, somewhere else into the Balkans then for working for the International Rescue Committee. How, how, you know, these experiences in these countries, how was it for you? Yeah, Good. So the Sierra Leone piece was actually a mis it was a mistake, really. I did my dissertation from university in Sierra Leone, but it's not a place that you could just visit and tick nice beaches. You know, great visit. It's, it's a country. It was the poorest country in the world at the time. It's still mm -hmm. the ninth poorest country in the world. So it's a very compelling case to try and get involved and help a bit. So we ended up just helping some kids and it grew from there. And now we have a professional board and you know, good funding and do some nice, nice stuff in education. And it, it's very, obviously, it's very um, motivating. You, you know, I spent, I lived in Rwanda as well, um, oh, and then nice. in the Balkans. It, it gives you a, a clear sense of perspective. I think if you spend time in these countries, you know, I know the word privilege is not, is not one that everybody likes, but I feel immensely privileged in my background. Uh, mm -hmm. You go and see how much of the world lives, maybe most of the world, lives in not great conditions i feel pretty privileged so yeah i think it gives me perspective um yeah. hopefully an openness to other cultures yeah i totally empathize with you because i was uh, in burundi in 94 oh. which is just next to rwanda and you know just yeah, after yeah, that happened, yeah. I've, and when I've i left burundi like, too, huh? ah, okay so you know, <laughs> know Bujumbura, yeah. the party city yeah <laughs> all right <laughs> Um, so then you went into financing as a CFO and then you uh, you funded Mason Breeze, right? We'll get back to your company right after. I think what's really in, in interesting as well is that you live in Zurich, your wife lives in Jersey, um, and she's a language therapist. So I, when we get to the inclusive language, I certainly would like to hear from you what kind of you know thoughts she has about inclusive language because she's a super specialist in this. So, sure, sure. So Mason Breeze is a, in many ways, we're a classic consultancy 
um, you know, we help companies to change, to implement new systems, to finance systems in particular, or these days automation uh, is a big thing that we are we like to help with, and um, and data and analytics, predictive analytics, so helping people to unlock value in their data. Most companies have piles of data that they where value is locked away, and we try to help them to. Um, to unlock it and to to oh. find new revenue streams or on the automation side to to make things more efficient so the the staff can stop doing what are called swivel chair activities i type something here i turn my chair i type the same thing here it's you know those days should be gone so we help companies with that kind of transition to a more digital way of working and and where is the mason breeze active so yeah um so our footprints we started in jersey um, we have um, consultants in London, Edinburgh, um, Northern Ireland, Isle of Man, and Zurich. Um, we have worked in countries actually all over the world, um, but the Zurich presence was our biggest client, asked us if we could come and set up in Zurich to do the same thing for them here that we have done for them uh, in the UK and in Jersey. So that was a nice opportunity three years ago. Um, it's gone very well. Switzerland is a fantastic place to to work. I, I absolutely love it, actually. <laughs> okay. Even though you're separated from your wife while you're working here, <laughs> poor you. Yeah, well, we, you know, we travel uh, a bit. Um, I, I go by yeah. train, actually, sometimes, and ferry to get back to Jersey and um, ah, weekends, oh, but we try to see each other every week. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. So, well, let's get to the subject of diversity and inclusion, right? This is what we're here for. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I could talk to you about your CV for the, <laughs> for the whole 30 minutes. But anyway, let's get to diversity and inclusion. So what what does diversity and inclusion for, uh, mean for you personally? Sure. So I, I think I should start off with a, a bit of a, a honest confession that the concept of inclusion is relatively new to me you know I think I've only been thinking about it actively maybe in the past five years um, and diversity likewise it was not really something that I I thought about explicitly um, you know and then became aware that actually not everyone is the same as me now that seems like a really obvious thing to say but the it was the understanding that the way someone else experiences the world can be radically different from the way I experience it and that that has actual real meaningful impact to them on a day-to-day -day and minute-by-minute -minute basis so you know again it's not that popular to you know I am a privileged white middle class fellow and I'm not I'm not ashamed of that in any way but it's true that my experience of the world is shaped by that you know I uh, and other people, they don't have the same experience. And maybe it should just be obvious to all of us that that's true. However, I think having um, now the chance to think about inclusion and what it means to be open to other people, um, it's, changed my, it's changed my perspective on the world. And for me, inclusion is about really that openness. It's about an openness to recognising that things might not just be the way I've always thought they are. Things might not be the way I experience them. And other people will have um, they come at things differently they will be uh, motivated differently however it's uh, they will have things and in a professional context they will have skills which are very valuable to us sometimes valuable because they're different um, so that's you know it's, it's that experience of openness and of welcome um, a feeling of belonging um, inclusion is about helping people to feel like they belong and that they are welcome there is something, um, I have a, a, a colleague, I'm managing director, Chris, who, who points out that much of this is just about being a decent human being. Um, and uh, that is true, but I think it's good to to articulate it in the sort of language, language that we do, because then you can say, well, these things don't work. These things are very off-putting to some groups. This is better. And we talk about the language of inclusion. You know, this language is more inclusive. And that's, you know, that's a... Just a basic kind of um, approach for me. Am, am I being open and fair and and reasonable? Um, yeah. I think. Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 I think it's super interesting what you're saying. I wonder if you know since you realized like consciously, right, that you have to look at this. 
have you actually kind of changed your behavior when you talk to someone who has a diverse background? Do you listen better or do you ask them um, more easily about their perspective? Yes, I think I think very much so. So one of the things I also realized uh, is that this, you know, it's not a badge, diversity or, you know, inclusion, inclusivity. They're not badges that you wear. You say, you know, I went on a training course and now I'm inclusive. It's a journey. <laughs> We, exactly. you know, we learn all the time, and also because a lot of the a lot of this space is is changing very fast. Um, you know, what we thought we understood three years ago will be different today. Um, and if you think, for example, in the world of um, the trans world, you know, we're learning so much about how to be inclusive to people from different backgrounds, um, and you just got to accept you're going to get it wrong. Um, you know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. And I, I don't find, though, that people are ever upset about that. It's just honest and you say, you know, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't understand that. or And that's where the openness comes in. But you used a really important term, and it's listening. So listening to other people is absolutely critical. And being, you know, a little bit vulnerable sometimes, being prepared to accept that actually this thing that I thought I was doing in good faith actually isn't great, and I should stop doing it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, some of the language maybe I used, um, and maybe, you know, I'm 50. So some of that language I've been using for a very long time. It's kind of hard to unlearn some of that. Well, people are pretty forgiving if they know that you're trying. So, so yes, yeah. I think it has changed significantly and recognising that listening to other people is very powerful. We, we have um, quite a, a diverse uh, company, in fact, I mean, Masonbury Switzerland is the United Nations. We, we have <laughs> we're not a big, big company, but we have, you know, I think there are only two people uh, from the same place, um, and that's okay. kind of, that's cool. We have one Swiss, yeah. Bulgarian. We have you know a Lithuanian. We have two Jersey, one UK. So you know we are very, we're very listening to those other people and their experiences and what they bring to the table is really important. Yeah, yeah, and it really makes you rich as well, right? It's it's a uh, it gives you these different perspectives. It also means that in your work you can integrate in order to understand your your partners better, understand your markets better, and so forth. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you just think of, I, I think it really impacts leadership, actually, Nadia. I think um, it changes. It should change the way we lead. So. Traditional leadership was a kind of bang the table and tell people what's going to be done and just do it. In an inclusive uh, environment, an ecosystem is not like that at all. It's always going to be more collaborative. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to have strong characters expressing themselves. It's about how they do that and, and how you make sure that the people who are not so loud, also their voice is heard. Because they're not going to have worse things to say. <laughs> Typically, they have great things to say. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Being inclusive means making sure you give space for people to have their voice heard um, and they feel comfortable doing it. That That's a really interesting question now. How What do you do at work in your office? I mean, when was diversity and inclusion becoming a thing uh, in your company? Actually, how, how did you bring it in? You know, what's yeah. happening? So I'm, I'm a pretty liberal guy, you know, and I started this company and then we suddenly looked around. And we realized that without meaning to, we did not have many women in our company. This was in Jersey. Um, and we had grown very organically and quite quickly. And I was like, how is that possible? You know, I'm not, I don't think of myself as being prejudiced or biased. And, um, but of course, unconscious bias is a factor. Also, what does your job advert look like if you do advertise? And we didn't advertise a lot actually at the time. We just did our recruitment by word of mouth. So, you know, an employee would introduce a friend and say, well, I, I have done interviews. I'm sorry to say this, but in the pub. Well, that's not oh, a very yeah. good interview. And it's not a very inclusive environment. <laughs> yes. you know, without meaning to, you suddenly create a company full of men who look like you. And that's mm-hmm. not at all what I wanted, but it was unconscious and and the problem with it, of course, is it makes the company weaker. You don't get that diversity of voice, which suddenly means that, you know, which brings safety. It, it makes companies safer to be more diverse. 
then you make better decisions if you are more inclusive and, you're, and you are more diverse. I think you know McKinsey's done some some um, a recent study in this, and, and you know there is a lot of evidence that diversity makes companies more profitable and it makes them more resilient. And I, I would say that's absolutely true. Um, yeah. So for our Jersey business, we've got a way to go still to rectify that. You can't rectify that in two seconds, but we've been on a journey for the last three, four years, maybe. Um, in Switzerland, we set it up differently, <laughs> I'm glad okay. to say. And right. very, very conscious choices, um, you know, about how that would work. That, that is really interesting. How do you observe these differences in geographies? Uh, diversity and inclusion is a, a thing everywhere, but we know, for example, that in the US, it's much more talked about. In, in the UK, more than continental Europe. In Germany, more than Switzerland. Switzerland, I always think, is really <laughs> very behind with everything. How do you yeah. experience that with your different locations? There's certainly a cultural factor. So when I first moved to um, Jersey, it was not a very diverse place, and the concept of inclusion was absolutely not there at all. It's changed radically in 15 years. It is now a much more diverse place. So they, they had pockets of immigrant workers from a couple of different nationalities that they would be not include you know not included in the national in the, you know, the island debate so jersey is its own jurisdiction by the way for those who don't know it has its own currency its own parliament its own law so it's effectively a country and right. you know those populations were just not included in the daily political life of the island and were not represented in senior positions in business that is changing significantly And I think it has led, clearly the influence of America is significant. Uh, the UK has followed America. Um, I think Switzerland, I find, is um, probably not as far down the road as it's, as some of the European neighbours, as you say. However, very hearteningly, you know, my, my big client here in Switzerland, you know, to hear the leader of that business stand recently and do a podcast to all staff on the importance of diversity and inclusion was a real milestone. That's that's a fantastic moment. And I don't think that would have happened five years ago, certainly not 10. Uh, things are changing in Switzerland pretty fast in this space. Um, and maybe it's things like the McKinsey um, evidence showing that actually profitability is impacted, which is helping people. I always say there are two reasons for, for you know being diverse and inclusive. The first is that it's the right thing to do, you know, back to the decent human being piece. The second mm -hmm. is it makes you more profitable. You can choose your reason, but you should do it anyway. <laughs> I like you can choose your reason, but you should do it anyway, whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. And where do you think you are on this journey with Mason Breeze now? A um, long way to go. Um, I think that's, yeah. That's so. I think maybe the problem with your question is it sort of seems to imply that there is an end place, and I don't. Yeah, think that's that, true. probably. I don't think true. there is an end place. I think <laughs> being open to understanding that there are, um, you, you know, there is always more to learn. There is all, always more that other people's experiences which can help, um, and which are val valid. Um, so I think our journey is just to make sure that we we continue to. You know, try to be open to encourage others to be open. One of the things we do have to talk about, I think, is um, a lot is, of course, the, the so-called culture wars are big and diversity and inclusion are a target for those who really want to pursue the, the culture wars. I think they are grossly mistaken. It's my view just, um, I think, to create conflict out of people trying to be more inclusive is insane. However, we can't ignore the fact that it's happening. Um, and I get I get a lot of hassle from people about this sometimes, you know, there are voices I've been accused of all sorts of pretty unpleasant things because I'm into just trying to be a little bit more broad minded and a little bit more open. Well, that is, you know, the state of the world we're in. There are folks out there who will say some pretty nasty things if you say, well, I, this is an agenda we want to pursue. But for Mason Breeze, I think it's clear The sort of leadership that we're now into is demonstrating those values, trying hard to demonstrate those values. And I can't say we always succeed in them at all. And there also, there is no um, single view of what diversity and inclusion look like. There are multiple views of them, but there is a broad strand, which we would all agree on, and that is an openness to and a welcoming 
to to people um, from a variety of backgrounds. I think the other thing I'd say about it is it's very very often the case that we are accused of uh, tokenism. And by tokenism, I mean, well, are you just going to hire this person because they're a woman or because they're black? Or and of course you're not. That would be insane. Mm -hmm. I mean. Mm -hmm. How to damage your a consultancy company, you know, put out someone just because they've got a particular set of characteristics. That's not going to work. What it means is being open to the fact that the characteristics we really do desire, certain level of intelligence, maybe, um, which is not, you know, intelligence is a problematic concept, actually, because how do you really measure it? Many different kinds of intelligence. But broadly, a level of intelligence um, with some empathy, with good communication skills, those things come from... A million different backgrounds and that's really what we want and i'm not abandoning any of those requirements for the people in our company at all um, and as leaders we should try to demonstrate values that say we are open to people from many backgrounds to to come and join us if they are if they tick those boxes right right i think that's always the problem when i hear people telling me we only want the best people is as if People with diverse backgrounds couldn't be the best ones, right? That always sounds very weird to me. Come and meet, come and meet our consultants, and you will see people from diverse backgrounds. It can be absolutely fantastic. I can't remember who it was, Nadia, but there's some someone clever way back said, "Always hire people who are better than you." And I've made a whole career out of doing so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, um, how is the reaction within the company? Like, are there any, you know, if you're going big on diversity and inclusion, all also, you know, communicated towards the inside, communicated towards the outside. Are there any reactions from your own employees kind of saying, hey, you know, what's going on? A, a bit sometimes. I think we have a robust conversation about it. Um, I think having the conversation is very important because by the end of it, perhaps we can reduce the, the the feeling of some people are feeling threatened by it um but yeah of course we, we do have a robust conversation i mean one of the conversations we have is what should be your reaction when you find yourself in a situation where behaviors are not as they should be uh, and there are some voices which say um well you know it's a journey and we have to respect people as they go down that journey and there are others who say you should just confront them and mm. you know that is an int interesting discussion and i don't know the answer to that actually myself um I, I think that's probably personality you know my personality is going to play quite a big factor in how how i think i should react in those circumstances but within the company yeah there's a very healthy tension around this stuff how far should you go you know what what is mm -hmm. reasonable um that's well welcome to me as long as people feel able to express their voice which i i hope they they are but then they do it respectfully and they are actually, I do think if you're going to join the conversation, you've got to be prepared to listen to others. Um, don't, don't come knowing all of the answers and don't come with a closed mind. There's no point. Um, but thankfully yeah. in the company, we haven't experienced that. So. Yeah, I mean, exactly what you're saying, right? It's all a journey for us. It's all a learning process. So we cannot assume that everybody knows from the start and that we all know how to do it from the start. So the openness and and I guess trust has to be there to really make this learning environment, right? Sure. There are some really good um, questions here from our listeners and viewers. That's really cool. Thank you. So I had um, here is Nidhi Joshi um, asking, you know, how do we consciously be inclusive, like some daily practices that will help at the workplace? Can you give some tips? Yep, absolutely. I think it, it requires some real careful thought. And the thoughts is around uh, how do I identify places in our daily practice where we are not inclusive? What what is some of the language which maybe is used or some of the practices which are not inclusive? And if I think I can answer that question myself, then I'm mistaken. So when we had a little moment in Mason Breeze way back in some years ago, and we looked at ourselves and said, what on earth happened? Where are all the women? Um, we had some really interesting answers to that. And uh, the easy answer is, well, they, did, they don't apply. They don't apply. So we can't hire them if they don't apply. Wrong answer. The question <laughs> is, why don't they apply? So when we asked the women on our company that, we were overwhelmed with great answers. They were like, have you seen your websites? 
have you seen the language you guys use you guys mm -hmm. use <laughs> um that's a really good point so i think the the, pra the the practical answer to that question is you need to ask people in the firm what are the things that we can do just or where do we get it wrong and what do we need to do to change how we operate now that requires um, a level of perhaps humility it can feel a little threatening sometimes particularly folks who are wedded to an old-fashioned kind of leadership um, that could feel quite threatening but to me that's that's got to be the way to go is to identify the practices so for example things like um, um, early morning meetings work brilliantly for bachelors work terribly for people mums and dads who have to get kids to school don't do that mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. late night meetings similarly um, you know there are things that just are really great if you happen to be that sort of sociopathic uber driven <laughs> leader who just says well family second but actually that's not great either you, you you lose people along the way they start to think bad things about you and the company they they're not motivated to work in a company where those are the demands so i think um real practical things about inclusion are are a consideration of those factors are likely to come in um one of the really big things for us was uh to allow flexible working we were scared that if we went to our clients and said you know we've got these people who need to work flexibly is that going to work for them our, you know our clients pay us by the day so there is an old-fashioned school in mm -hmm. consulting that says if we're paying you we want to see you there with a jacket on the back of the chair and we want you to be first and last out the door mm -hmm. so we discovered though absolutely no problem whatsoever um it is sad to say but we found that um return to work mums feel that they have to work harder to prove themselves if they want to work flexibly. They shouldn't have to, but they do. Mm -hmm. the, the upside for our clients is that they typically get a massive return from a particularly return to work mums. I don't, we've had one return to work dad, um, but these folks feel they have to prove themselves by over delivering. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not a negative at all for our clients. And our clients now recognize that, you know, they, if I turn up and say I've got a fantastic person for this project that you, you're running, we can come and help you with that. They need to just work four days a week or they need to work restricted hours. No problem. That's, that's really interesting what you're saying because it has been seen that working moms actually fall into burnout uh, more. Um, and then I guess it, I believe it's, because it. That, right? it's because of that pressure that you have to be better. Now, Joseph also here um, asks a really nice question. He says, we're faced with a cultural drawback where women fear to take leadership role. So what have you done in order to, you know, not fall into this trap? Sure. Um, so we did fall into the trap. We have a board of directors, which is all male. It is not what we want. Um, we are very keen to address it. Um, and you know, having got ourselves to that situation, as I said earlier, reme remediation is not so easy. Um, you know, I can't just fire a director and appoint another. I can't just appoint more directors. You know, it was you know, mayor culpa. We got ourselves into a bad place and, and we need to fix it. Um, I think the question, though, hints at something really important, which is will women fear to take leadership roles? Women won't fear to take leadership roles if the leadership role they're being asked to take is one where they are comfortable. If they're going to just sit there in a leadership role surrounded by people who don't really value their input, talk over them. Um, it's a very common complaint women have in leadership is their colleagues talk over the top of them and don't listen to them. So I think making it a, um, an environment where women are able to voice um, you know their their opinion and they bring their own talents freely and and well and they feel valued and then they will absolutely step up and of course there is something about um, making sure that um, there is a there are role models you know so female role role models in particular have to have to be there and showing the way you know that it is perfectly possible for me to be successful reality is actually probably. The best boss I ever had was a woman, and that was early in my career. Um, you know, she was navigating a very difficult, uh, I would say, precarious world for women um, 
in financial services consulting back in the 1990s. Absolutely fantastic and was a great role model to the people around it. So we have, within our firm, we actually have a very flat hierarchy deliberately. Um, and so we do have plenty of women who really help us with, um, you know, I, I think providing great role model of how to be a good uh, leader um, and, and lead consultants as well. You know, some of our fantastic consultants are women. So trying to provide space for them, um, trying to make sure that we don't have practices which exclude women in particular. Um, these are really important. You have to focus on them and then ask women. <laughs> you know, don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think it's really interesting what you're saying about the whole leadership, right? I think also we have to define leadership in a new way. Um, because the world is changing, it's becoming more agile, more digital, but also because we get all this diversity in and the leadership role so far, in my view, was very defined in a very, um, how do you say, capitalist or industrial way where you as a boss, you manage and you distribute tasks. And I think we have to move away from that leadership view. Also, it was always the extroverted person that gets into a leadership role. And I think also that is a big problem, right? We expect to always hear the answers instead of, uh, I think the, the new leader is much more about asking the questions so people get to their own answers. Uh, hey, but absolutely. let's move over. Let's move over to inclusive language. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Really cool. um, so uh, I, I first actually wanted to, to ask you, how did you find out about WittyWorks? So we found out about WittyWorks. Um, well, it was after we had we placed an advert and uh, for it, it was a technology role. We had 27 men reply, not a single woman. And we knew we had a problem. And um, my Swiss operations director, Daniela, said, OK, so this isn't working and we need to do something. So she, she she's the link uh, into WittyWorks. And she said, I mean, it was quite a moment, actually. She said, Swithin, we need to go and do something about this and we need to spend some money. And it's quite a hard decision for me. I, like the idea of paying someone to help you to use more inclusive language. That was, you know, OK. Anyway, um, the results of that particular advert and I so I tracked various characteristics of applicants for our jobs and it was very clear we were struggling to to reach a diverse audience or struggling to in any way appeal to a diverse audience you know this was within the last three years so I knew by this stage that you have to pay attention to it mm -hmm. so uh, Daniela said we need to go and speak to these people at Witty Works and um and it was, I was absolutely overjoyed that she did because the results would be spectacular. Well, let me hear about the results. What happened? Yeah, sure. So next advert we placed, um, we put it through uh, the full WittyWorks consultative process. Um, there were some fairly shocking amendments made. Um, <laughs> How, what, what do you mean by fairly shocking amendments? What, what well, happened? I'd spent my whole career, for example, writing... Uh, job adverts where you list every possible criteria that you could want. I, I, I am aware, I've, you know, I've, I've seen it and spoken to women about this historically, but that if you write a lot of, you have a lot of criteria, you know, 15 criteria, men looking at that typically, and this is a horrible generalization perhaps, but it, there is some truth in it. Men will look at it and say, oh, I can do three of those things. I'm going to apply for that job. <laughs> Whereas, and I have experienced it many times. Women either don't apply because they say, well, there are three things on there that I have no experience of, or they apply. And then in the interview, they talk about the three things they can't do on the list. All right. And, and it's really unfortunate, but it's, um, I, t I don't know how to analyze it. Maybe it's a confidence thing, but, um, you know, I know really excellent, quite senior professional women who have done this and taught themselves out of good jobs. Um, so learning from witty works, firstly, that some of the language you need to use has to change. It is deeply unappealing um, to talk about, you know, some of the, some of the things that we wouldn't, you know, we need people who are driven and, you know, all of that stuff that was very traditional. Phrasing things differently can have a, um, it, you know, a different, um, a very different outcome. And then setting up the process really clearly. If you apply, this is what's going to happen. We will assess your CV. We will interview you once. We will interview a second time. 
we will make you an offer and this is the time frame. That really helps, I think. Uh, we've had feedback that that helps. So it's not just me saying it. But then cutting down the criteria, because putting 15 criteria for a job is just lazy. Just <laughs> yes. Putting everything on a page because I can't be bothered to spend the time to think hard about it and do the job of reducing it down to actually what do we really need. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that was it was very instructive for us. And the outcome was we had applicants who would never have, never have come forward. They told us so. And they told us that they applied because they liked the advert. They felt it was inclusive. We got asked if the advert had been written by a robot. Oh, really? <laughs> we did, yeah. We said, no, no, it was, this was written by a human, but it was deliberately designed to try to use inclusive language and try to make sure that we weren't um, excluding people subconsciously, which is what happens if you don't think about it. You just use language which excludes people. So it was a... Um, it was, and we hired two uh, extraordinarily um, talented women um, into our firm last year who would not have applied otherwise. Okay, that's really, really cool to hear. Yeah. And, and also thank you for your explanations because it really helps to make it very um, obvious what's really happening in the minds of people, right? Sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It was great. We asked them. We said, you know, why did you apply? Because we haven't yeah. seen applicants like them before. And they were crystal clear and it was the advert okay so cool this is what inclusive language can do and for everyone who's listening in i mean we have a freemium um you can go to witty.works and just use our freemium in order to write inclusively so in general i wanted to ask you and maybe as a last question also with the background that your wife has what mm -hmm. is your, your your general understanding of inclusive language what it can do in our society and in our business world yeah, so I think that what it can do is it can it can expose uh, a lot more people to a lot more experiences. What I mean by that is if the prevailing narrative is not inclusive, then you'll get a narrow set of people leading companies or doing specific things, and it's very isolating. So financial services was always very white and male in the background I came from. That, that has changed significantly, not enough, but it has changed a bit. What inclusive language does is it means that it's a much more welcoming environment for people from all sorts of different backgrounds, for women, for people of colour, for people from a diverse range of faiths. or you know, And, and it's, it means that those people are going to be there. And practically, that means that businesses will be better run. I'm, I'm really keen to make that very concrete connection. Businesses will operate better and be better run if we use inclusive language and if we try to think about or listen to the things which do not work and avoid them. That's a very strong statement. Thank you very much. Did you have any feedback from your um, from your wife about this as she specialised in language? Yeah, she has specialised in language. So, yeah, she talks about it quite a lot she works with um actually interestingly she works with uh, she's a pediatric speech therapist and um she's a specialist with deaf children and with children with learning difficulties um and her world was also designed strangely despite the fact that most practitioners are women but the world the research and the um the training was very male dominated but that has changed They've, so they're now finding that they use more inclusive language and it works so much better. The therapies that they deliver are better with more inclusive language uh, for children, starting right from the, you know, she was sat with a, a, a child the other day, born completely deaf, had cochlear implant put in and they turned on the computer and they just started turning up. And she's been with this child and now she's, you know, got to start using certain, getting the child to speak and to introducing language and the language they will introduce will certainly be inclusive language and not some of the language that her industry would have would have used historically okay cool <laughs> hey so cool um we, i think we come to the end uh, here with sweden it was fabulous to talk to you very thank you very very much for your insight oh, thanks thanks nadia it's, a, it's a, such an important topic and i'm i'm passionate about it if i'm not an expert admittedly but i'm passionate about it but I think none of us can be experts, right? It's because we all are learning. <laughs> That's really Absolutely. cool. Absolutely. Yeah. 
thanks everyone for being with us. Um, thanks again, Swithin. Uh, I wish you the best with your company and with your um, efforts in diversity inclusion. Thanks so Have much, a nice Nadia. Day. Thank okay. you. Have a nice day, everyone. Okay, Bye. You.